So uh, welcome back uh, to the next session of this uh, Cornerstone Ideas in Material Science and Engineering course. Uh, so as far as some of the things uh, that we will be covering today is concerned, uh, we will revisit the idea of concept map or mind map and uh, associated ideas in education research. And the other content that we'll cover, the materials content that we'll cover will be to do with something called lattices. Uh, educators, of course, know about it. And um, many upper level students also know about it. And the second thing is bonding. So we will have discussions about these two ideas. And uh, in fact, I will only get started with this and this will continue into the next session. So we will just have a preliminary discussion on this, uh, but we will start out with a discussion on lattices. So coming back to uh, instructor nodes. So I would like to introduce uh, an important idea and that is this idea of uh, instructional scaffolding. So as I told you, uh, scaffolding is essentially providing a framework for the learner uh, so that we facilitate the learning and the educational process in an optimal manner. And uh, this comes from an important idea and that is of constructionism. Constructionism essentially means to say that any discipline, for that matter any academic discipline, uh, will have a certain construction about it. And the reason why mind maps work so well is, in my opinion, primarily to do with the fact that it provides a framework wherein various ideas are connected to one another and the linkages are made more explicit to the learner and there's a visual representation of the same. Uh, so it has roots not only in educational research, but also in, uh, it turns out, the philosophy of science uh, because uh, it, the emphasis here is to provide a context, that is why this word contextualism, a context for the lessons that are provided. It is not sufficient for us to introduce concepts to the students without providing a context. It is not sufficient primarily because the students wouldn't know where to apply the learnings, where to apply the lessons that we are teaching them. And as a consequence, it is very powerful when you introduce ideas along with context. And uh, this uh, is, in my opinion, a very powerful idea, very helpful in planning lessons. It doesn't matter which course you are teaching, it certainly will help you in thinking about the ways in which you could introduce ideas to students, okay? And it promotes assimilation, that's what I have written here. It promotes assimilation and application of concepts and ideas that we teach our students, okay? So mind map, this is something that I have uh, spoken about in the last session. So it's a radial diagram of concepts. So it radiates out and concepts are connected to one another. Keywords and pieces of information are connected to one another. And this connected diagram gives students uh, an understanding of the context of the information uh, that they are soaking up, that they're assimilating, they're accommodating in their minds and so on and so on. So um, this is also relevant for teachers. So there are tools that are available for mind mapping. This is also relevant for students. Uh, so there is a free online tool called VUE. Uh, it's also called ViewGraph. Uh, the modern version of it is available for free. It can be downloaded. And there are many other freewares that are available for mind mapping. So you can download it in your laptop. Some of these mind map softwares allow collaborative mind mapping. So let's say you are having a collaborative learning exercise with another person. You are planning a project with another person. So you can share the same mind map with one another. You can see what they are drawing. You can add to that drawing and you can do this simultaneously in an online platform. So there are many such platforms that are available and uh, there is a list of it that is available in this particular uh, wiki page. All right, so these are mind map tools and very easily accessible. A large number of them are open sources. Concept map, as I told you, is a little bit more hierarchical in structure. There's a hierarchy of information and hence it is called the tree diagram. So concepts are connected in the form of, uh, of branches. Uh, there is a downward branching that is typically observed. And here is an example. I apologize for the poor picture, uh, but it comes from an educator in Qatar. Uh, named Bingo and he drew this for basic concepts of thermodynamics wherein he connects various ideas and uh, for his students all right so between let us say uh, state variables steady state flow processes 
uh, open system, closed system, how they are similar to one another, how they are dissimilar from one another, uh, what is the idea of equilibrium and so on. So he connects these things in this uh, particular diagram, all right. So uh, there is cue for further thought as far as teachers are concerned. Thank you very much. Um, so could mind, concept and spider maps be used for your projects? So in the context of your classrooms, of course, you could use these mind maps, concept maps and so on. But can you think about project ideation by using these mind maps, concept maps and so on, all right? So is it possible? Can you help your MS PhD students using this? Can your MS PhD students use mind maps and concept maps for better pr project ideation, hypothesis generation, problem statement creation? Is it possible for you to actually think about it? This is an open territory, by the way. I have not seen research in this. I have seen research wherein people have used mind maps to teach different kinds of people, nursing students, management students, medical students, a wide number of studies on medical education because medical education is considered uh, very information heavy. And mind maps have been found to be very powerful in, uh, in making sure that the learning outcomes are achieved for medical doctors. But I have not seen, to the best of my knowledge, so far, any information on how mind maps could influence uh, MS PhD education. But I personally uh, highly recommend MS PhD students for doing this. I have used it in my, in my own group, for example. And there are a few cases wherein it has been enormously successful. So I really believe that this can help not only your uh, lower level students, it can also help your MS PhD students. And uh, would such maps be helpful for you for learning, deep learning? And as teachers, we constantly learn. On a daily basis, we are learning. So deep learning is also something that we are passionate about, we enjoy. So can we use tools of this sort for our own deep learning? This is one thing. And another thing is uh, this keyword, semantic mapping. So these concept maps, mind maps, various knowledge maps, they are called semantic mapping in information science. And um, uh, this is a very generic idea, not just in educational research, but also in information science, in computational science and so on. It is about categorizing information, finding properties associated with keywords and seeing connects between them. So uh, please do read about it and uh, also uh, do uh, uh, pay some attention to this concept of ontology, which means representation of categories. And when you represent categories and the connects between these categories and the properties of these categories, you start seeing how knowledge emerges. And this is very important for an MS PhD student. This is very important for us teachers. It's a very essential part of an educator's life. And as a consequence, I wanted to introduce this also. By the way, there are software tools that are used now, useful for now, uh, including software tools that allow you to categorize information. One such tool is uh, actually being developed at Google. It is called the Knowledge Graph Project, and it might be also relevant for you and your students. Okay, and uh, Bloom's taxonomy is something that I introduced you to, uh, the various levels in Bloom's taxonomy. And please note, very often in our classrooms, we actually engage students at this level. We give them information and we expect them to understand. We rarely expect them to apply or analyze, critically evaluate or create by themselves. But in the last session, you saw that there was this classroom discussion that was at the creativity level that required students to really engage, maybe even struggle, it doesn't matter. The whole idea is to actually provide a framework, perhaps a guided framework, so that they learn to create, they learn the art of creation, creating their own ideas, uh, and become comfortable with uncertainty because it's an important part of being a knowledge worker in this day and age. And why should an uh, educator employ Bloom's taxonomy? In my opinion, an educator should employ Bloom's taxonomy because it allows us to organize the learning objectives for our students and it enables us to plan our instruction in a cohesive and consistent manner. So our instruction can be driven uh, towards the goal of learning outcomes. So that is really the reason why I typically use Bloom's taxonomy while creating questions, question banks, uh, exam, setting exam papers, also for my lesson planning and so on and so on. Okay, so uh, with that we will shift to the content part. I will take a break here. Uh, as far as the content part is concerned, uh, as I told you, we will talk about lattices first. And I will introduce lattice by asking a question. Okay, And the question is, you have freedom to make bricks. You are all brick makers, 
okay you have freedom to freedom to make bricks and you are told that you have to fill up the space you have to fill up space so for example your bricks can be like this you know you can see that they fill up space there is no gap in between okay so what are the possible shapes of these bricks that are allowed can i have any shape or are my shapes limited that's my question you understand so i could ask the same question about tiles i could be a tile maker can i make tiles of any shape to spill this to fill this floor or am i limited in my possibilities if i am limited in my possibilities in what way am i limited can you draw some diagrams in your sheet and explain to me if there are any limitations or if there are no limitations so discuss with one another and ask yourself this question you could ask question about the tile or about bricks brick would be three dimensional tiles would be for all practical purposes for the purpose of this discussion two dimensional right so can i fill this floor by using tiles of any random shape the criteria is all the tiles should be cell should be similar to one another that is the constraint so if i have this tile that is rectangular this should have exactly the same geometry the same dimensions etc etc in one set all the uh, tiles should have yeah you cannot have a mix of rectangular tiles and triangular tiles and whatever that's not allowed if you choose triangle stick to triangle same dimensions if you choose rectangle choose rectangle of the same dimensions and you work with that so what are the possibilities as far as tiling is concerned or what are the possibilities as far as brick laying is concerned as far as space filling uh, is the goal that we have in mind you understand the question so discuss with one another you can start drawing make cartoons you understand the question you understand the question yes, yeah so like so can i can i work with the triangle here can i work with uh, rectangle here can i work with rectangle quite obviously isn't it you can see it huh can i work with uh, a pentagon can i work with a hexagon can i work with an octagon can i work with a decagon what are the possibilities i have that's the my question you understand do you understand the question so draw draw so for the all practical purposes this is your two dimensional space and you can tile you can have some tiling here some other tiling here it's up to you do you understand the question yes no tiles tiles there are no circles tiles so i can have triangle rectangle square you know pentagon heptagon hexagon octagon you come up with whatever choice you want what are the possibilities i have ha huh? Uh, draw and show me i do not know whether you are right or wrong i, I do not know so many of you are playing with triangles do they seem promising can you space fill using triangles yeah seem promising not surprising because see i can work with this i can just split it here and lo and behold i am actually working with rectangles sorry triangles all of which are the same geometry i lay it out and fine so triangles seem promising rectangles of course you can see it what about pentagons yes sir hexagons can be uh, now what about uh, pentagon it's possible i mean you have to fill a square uh, oh, this is actually very interesting the way you are filling it keep going so discuss with one another what is that you are thinking ah okay so both of you are filling pentagons that way okay i see and that strip you can reproduce that's what you are claiming mm. ah, so right. yeah so rectangles will work sure hexagon also will work uh, are you sure hexagon you will work a square space yeah hexagons will work all of you have seen honeycomb yeah. structures yeah. right you have seen honeycombs that are pentagon will not work ah pentagon why will it not work it, it will also work there will be space how will fill this space the pentagon is considerably more difficult hmm because Why? because if i divide it no also the way you are drawing it is this really a pentagon see look at the angles okay see look at the angles so you have uh, yeah so let us make it a regular pentagon okay 
So what will be the angle between the edges of a regular pentagon? Ah, that's about right. You are drawing it correctly actually. But uh, some of these angles, this is about right. So how would you find out the angle between edges of a pentagon? Okay. So am I correct? The number is. Oh, you can you can write down and see. So it's uh, so one the sum. Uh, ha, one eighty one eighty multiplied by three, right? So that is three sixty plus uh, so four forty five forty. That is correct. That's right. So correct. One not eight, right? One not eight degrees is the internal angle. So you have to show that one not eight. Some of you are showing perfectly different angles, yeah. very, very different angles, okay? So, 108. Now, with that 108, let us see whether you are able to fill the space. That's the question. Now, see, all of them have to be perfectly similar to one another. Your pentagon, one is big, one is small, yes. With that, you can space full, I agree. But that's not the question. Yeah, the no, question I is, yeah, I, I want to work with exactly the same shaped pentagon. Hmm? So, what at least? My pentagon works, his pentagon doesn't work. <laughs> you know, yes, my pentagon is superior to his pentagon, it actually space fills. You know? So, what is the obvious problem with your pentagon? You tell me. Angle is not. Exactly, you have been changing the angle to fill it. So it is not that your pentagon is, your pentagons are different from his pentagons. That is the reason why you are able to space fill, yes. Okay, so all of you now appreciate the fact that uh, tiling is actually a challenging problem, isn't it? It's a very challenging problem. In fact, there are people who have studied this geometrically. There are geometricians who have studied this. In fact, uh, there is an entire area of mathematics that is dedicated to tiling. Okay. So there are people who have looked at what are called as Penrose tilings and uh, there are people who have looked at uh, Persian tilings, you know, Persian art. They actually use tiles in a very brilliant manner, uh, using very complex geometrical rules and so on. But they play with different types of tiles. They don't necessarily play like this, but they actually, uh, there are very interesting ratios and proportions that you see in these tiles when you actually space fill them and so on and so on. Okay. Uh, but for the purpose of this discussion, because this is not a course on Persian, tile, Persian tiling or on Penrose tiling, it suffices for us to appreciate the fact that your tile cannot be arbitrary, correct? Your tile has to have some shape. So there are some predefined shapes that clearly seem to uh, enable space filling. That's really the take home of this particular classroom discussion. So take a look at what lattice means. So open up your data and uh, use your devices. What are lattices? What are crystal systems? And what is the distinction between the two? Okay, that will give an answer to this. Huh? But uh, that is not a regular pentagon, na? regular pentagon. All are regular pentagon. No, it's not a one not eight. One, uh, this is ninety degrees. Okay. You need one not eight degrees. Yeah, so open up your data, look at lattices. So that's what I am putting up here. Okay. Lattices. So you can have two dimensional lattices, three dimensional lattices, and in mathematics, higher dimensional lattices are allowed. All right, but of course, the world we live in is uh, three dimensional, and as a consequence, three dimensional lattice is certainly something that you can look up. Okay. There are things called lattices, and there are things called Bravais lattices. So take a look at Bravais lattice. So open your data. Something called Bravais lattice. And crystal system. And look at the formal definition of them and how are they different from one another. Bravais lattice versus crystal system. Crystal system is the shape of the brick. The constituents of the brick is the lattice. That is the difference. So, or what the brick defines, you know, uh, along with the probable constituents of it would be the lattice. So, uh, 
in analog uh, in analogy with the question that I asked. All right. So take a look at what Bravais lattices are. Open the data. How many Bravais lattices exist? And how many crystal systems exist? So how many crystal systems? That would be the shape of your brick. The crystal system would be the shape of your brick. Seven crystals. So there are seven shapes of bricks that are allowed for space filling. So it's remarkable, isn't it? So if you want to fill space, there are only seven possible ways in which you can make brick. Provided you are using the same brick all through, of course. If you are going to play with your pentagon and his pentagon and so on, it's a different story. But if uh, you are going to stick to geometry, as far as space filling is concerned, there are limitations. If you wanted to fill space with bricks, three-dimensional space with bricks, all of them which are exactly similar to one another, you would need to work with bricks that are one of those seven shapes. There are no other possibilities. All right. And what about crystal? So uh, those, so those are the seven crystal systems. It turns out. And how many Bravais lattices are there? Fourteen Bravais lattices. So those are the the shape of the brick with the constituents, the relevant places where atoms are sitting in your material. You understand the distinction between lattices and uh, crystal system? Crystal system is the brick. The constituents of the brick would be the lat uh, would be the lattice. You understand? So there are 14 Bravais lattices and how many crystal systems? Seven crystal systems. In fact, there's a very common question that materials engineers are asked, chemists are asked, physicists, solid state physicists, etc. are asked in a large number of interviews. What is the distinction between lattice and crystal system? It's a very, very common question. So it's very important for you to know. And, it turn and uh, I would also encourage you to know what those seven crystal systems are and the geometrical parameters associated with those seven crystal systems. Okay? All right? Okay. So that was the brick question. Okay? Now let's go to the next question. So there are only seven shapes allowed. That's the answer. Uh, there are, and, and there are those correspond to the crystal systems uh, in the atomistic regime. And uh, there are 14 ways to fill space fixed by what are called as symmetry constraints. Uh, the spelling of uh, constraints is different within each unit cell and these are called Bravais lattices, okay? Now, look at the next question. Uh, in your high school, for instance, you have been told that liquids don't have short range, they don't have order. Uh, there are crystalline objects that have long range order. Glasses don't have long range order, etc. What about Glasses, do they have short range order? What does short range order mean? That means I know the position of this atom, I would at least know the position of the neighboring few atoms. That's all short range order means. Long range order means I know the position of the atom here, I know the position of the, ne of, of the billionth atom from here. Okay, but short range order means I know the position of the atom here and I know the position of the neighboring, let us say three or four or five atoms. Okay, so discuss this with one another. Does it make sense to claim that you know, solids that are not crystalline can have short range order. So discuss with one another. If it makes sense, why does it make sense? What is the science behind it? Okay, so discuss with one another. You follow the question? You follow the question, right? So you understand the distinction between long range order and short range order. So now the question is, suppose I have something that is not crystalline. Is it still reasonable to think that there will be some kind of Short range order. Is it reasonable, unreasonable? If it is reasonable, why is it reasonable? Do you understand the question? Ah, yes, sir, I understand. Hmm. So you understand the question, Malay? So, so for example, there are, we have heard what a, about crystalline materials and amorphous materials and so on. So we say there is crystalline order here, long range order here. But I'm saying in this particular case, is it reasonable to think about at least short range order, some predictability about the positions of the atoms? Is it reasonable, unreasonable? If so, why? If yes, why? So you'll have to give me the reason also. That's why you should discuss with one another. Okay? You'll have to give me the reason. I won't accept a yes or a no. You might have read things from somewhere, but that's not the point. I want you to debate. You understand? Sir, I think it is reasonable to expect some short range order in every solid. Mm. Because uh, even if they are amorphous, 
the nature of bonding is uh, fixed Correct. Mm. nature of bonding is fixed so if it is a covalent uh, covalent bonding exists for example and the length of covalent bond i know mm. then at least up to a certain distance i can predict right so the answer comes from chemistry mm. right because all these atoms are bonded okay so if these atoms are bonded then i at least know and if i know the constituents that are coming together in this particular solid and if i know this is an atom sitting somewhere i know the other constituents and i know what the local bonding is and then i know the bonding around it and i know the bonding around it it may not be a lattice but at least uh, you know i will be able to predict there is a certain degree of predictability about where the near neighbor nearest neighbors are the next nearest neighbors are and so on and so on it's reasonable so short range order is actually expected in the case of any solid and for that matter it is expected in glasses amorphous solids it also is expected in the case of liquids for the same argument it has to do with the nature of chemical bonding okay it has to do with the nature of chemical bonding and it doesn't matter whether it's a covalent bond ionic bond and so on it has to do with the nature of bonding you, you if you are given any two atoms you know they actually connect with one another they bond with one another in a particular way right and as a consequence a certain predictability about their coordination their their subsequent coordination etc is reasonable makes sense right so absolutely right it has to do with bonding so uh, solids have long range order only when atoms repeat with a period much greater than bond lengths glasses like liquids have short range but no long range order so it has to do with the bond length so within the regime of bond lengths and few bond lengths and so on there is certain degree of predictability that is associated with atomic positions there are correlations that you can write position based correlations pair correlations that you can write you understand and that comes from chemistry that comes from the fact that these atoms are bonded to one another very good now let's look at the next question so read this question polycrystalline solids can be made so as to avoid uh, grain boundaries true or false so you have in some one of the previous sessions learnt about single crystalline systems polycrystalline also called multicrystalline systems and so on now here is a statement i can make polycrystalline solids that have no grain boundaries so what are grain boundaries they are essentially the boundaries between two different grains what are these two different grains these two different grains are like a crystal followed by another crystal that are sitting together so they are sitting against one another so i have a boundary in between okay so uh, but can i actually envision a polycrystalline material with no grain boundary that is the question so please discuss this with one another is it reasonable unreasonable what is uh, if there is no problem with the statement tell me so if there is a problem with the statement tell me so you understand can you explain one more time so uh, suppose uh, i have uh, multiple crystals okay that are sitting next to one another so this is one crystal so this is one blob so that means within them i know if i an atom sits here where the next atom sits and so on and i also know let's say an avogadro number of unit cells later where the next atom sits so this is a sufficiently big crystal and then uh, next to it there is another crystal but uh, these two crystals are not necessarily a lattice continuum they are not they are not a continuity of the same lattice the next to it another crystal that's not the same within this it's the same lattice yes i the lattice is well defined and so on but there is an abrupt Uh, you know discontinuity clearly as you go from one grain to another grain and so on and so on so my question is can you eliminate that in a polycrystalline system is it reasonable unreasonable change is not abrupt no no you will have to discuss with one another i do not you will have to discuss with one another and then come up with an answer Do you understand the question now? Do you understand the question now? Hmm. Bodhi, you understand? Sir, so we think that like uh, if the crystallographic orientation yes. changes, hmm. we cannot define a boundary. Like I have drawn hmm. a diagram. If I am having uh, planes like this, hmm. and somehow at one stage. the yes. angle starts to change very small yeah, and yeah. these small small changes after a distance it implements itself like this so 
I am now having a different crystallographic orientation. Hmm. But I cannot define a boundary, exact boundary. So th you are saying that this is happening over a really, really long distance. Yeah. You know, really long distance. That's what you are saying. Okay. So that's a very interesting hypothesis, by the way. That's very interesting. Yes, because uh, what you are saying is that the energy cost associated with this is low. This is low, and so on, so on. And eventually, the you know, over let's say an Avogadro number of uh, planes, there is a reorientation or something like that. That's what you are claiming. Yes. So. Um, some responses from there? It, it may not be possible mm -hmm. to have polycrystalline without. Yeah, without so that. by definition, ha, huh, so. Right. So if I have a grain with some orientation, another grain with another orientation, if they are both together in a single solid body, then clearly there should be a grain boundary, right? That is one response. That is correct. That's a very reasonable response. There's an interesting response here. What he says is, what if between the two, you have some fused region, wherein you have a very gradual change in the lattice, very, 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 very gradual change in the lattice. And as a consequence, you have a, so at some level, it is like having a bunch of, uh, I, it's like having a graded region in between where the lattice is actually undergoing transformation very, very slowly and so on. So that is an interesting possibility. Uh, in reality, it's very rare to actually see something like that. In reality, it is very rare, but that's a very interesting suggestion actually. Very, very interesting suggestion, no question about it. So, uh, so to summarize, polycrystalline materials inevitably will show you some kind of grain boundaries. It is normal to actually expect grain boundaries, but he is proposing a situation wherein there is no grain boundary uh, or the boundary is actually scattered over a very large… Uh, the change is so slow, so that slow. You cannot define a boundary. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, um, now that I think about it, it might actually be the case for a large number of… Uh, uh, even single crystal systems, you know, because even single crystal systems uh, could in principle uh, have defects. There are always defects in the single crystal, right? But do you have uh, defects that are the kind that you are talking about? Um, not really, because uh, think about it. The number of possible planes are limited. Right? So I have one arrangement of atoms, okay? And now you are saying that uh, in just the vicinity, I will have a little bit of tilt here and a little bit of tilt here and a little bit of tilt here. But it is a tilt because it is a plane that is getting disrupted. So you have a tilt. Yeah. You have a tilt. And as a consequence, you will have a grain boundary. So, but it could be, of course, a very, very mild tilt, in which case it is something called the low angle grain boundary. So there will be very low energy cost associated with it. On the other hand, if I have very abrupt tilt, then I, it would be something called as a high angle grain boundary. And there would be a huge energy cost associated with that particular grain boundary. No question about it. Now that I'm talking about the energy cost associated with these grain boundaries, since there is an energy cost associated with these grain boundaries, can you think about a way to actually eliminate these grain boundaries? So I'm giving you a polycrystalline system. Can you think about a way to eliminate those grain boundaries? You can do whatever, beat, heat, jump, dance on it, do whatever you want. But can you think about a way to eliminate that? Do you understand the question? Because you, we just arrived at the fact that, look here, I can actually have a tilt like this, a very mild tilt, in which case it's, it would be called something, co it would be called low angle grain boundary. Uh, alternatively, I could have something that is a high angle grain boundary. If it's a high angle grain boundary, there's energy cost associated with it. It's a strained system, correct? So nature would like to relieve its strain, right? Would like to relieve its uh, stored mechanical energy. So can you think about ways in which this polycrystalline material would be given some salvation, so to speak, you know, so that it becomes a single crystalline system. What are the methods by which you could do that? So why don't you discuss with one another? You understand the question? So this is also at the evaluate and creativity level. So I will make sure that uh, we are done. You know, uh, yeah. Do you all understand the question? asking by giving any kind of stimuli or a yeah. is it possible to is it a reasonable question right I have a bunch of mm. crystals that are sitting next to one another 
I could have them sit next to one another says that uh, as he pointed out it could be a low angle grain boundary in which case the energy cost is low. I could have them sit next to one another says that uh, it's a high angle grain boundary in which case the energy cost is high. Either ways there's an energy cost. Uh, can you relieve the crystal? That's my question. Can you relieve the material? That's the question. You understand? So discuss with one another. Can you make it a simple crystal yeah. out of yeah. polygons? Yeah. Yeah. Is it allowed, disallowed? No, think very simple. You know, you have two crystals, there is energy between them because of the surface interaction between two uh, crystals, like uh, two materials that are present in the crystal. If they are having uh, sufficient interaction, then they, they both can be simultaneously crystallized. No, you were talking about co crystal, yeah. but they are also a ordered. Arrangement in that. Yeah. Two molecules, but repeating. Yeah. Two molecules. Yeah. Two molecules. One molecule, different boundary. Grain boundary. See, 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 you have one crystal. You have another crystal. You have another somewhere here. Like. So, clear, if you have something like this, it's very happy a system. On the other hand, in between, you are twisting it this way. Then you are twisting something else somewhere else. And so on. It's an unhappy system. That means the, there is an energy cost associated with these grain boundaries. Can you relieve it? Is it allowed, disallowed? That's the question. You understand the question? We can allow by ground. Very good, exactly. That's right. So, if you can allow some recrystallization events, put it through recrystallization events, grain growth and recrystallization, grain growth and recrystallization. If you could do it again and again, eventually you will get to a point wherein you would have a crystal without these grain boundaries. That is absolutely right. Good job. Very nice. You arrived at it by yourself. So, by the way, uh, polycrystalline solids comprised of a collection of many single crystals. These are termed grains and as a consequence between them you have what are called as grain boundaries. I also introduce you to the idea of low angle and high angle grain boundaries because of Smarek's uh, hypothesis and um, which turns out to be correct by the way. And it turns out that there is this new word I want to introduce that is microstructure. Microstructure has to do with porosity. A, the number of phases and here the phase basically stands for thermodynamic phase okay so porosity second and any number of phases and their distributions can um, reveal whether or not a system is a polycrystalline obviously right so microstructure studies as a consequence are important how do you think you can study these things observe these things you'll have to do some kind of microscopy isn't it yes yes very good okay next question and here is where, you know, structure meets bonding, all right? So, look at this question. Are you able to see it, sir? So, this is the question. In silicates, the silicate tetrahedra share corner atoms more often than sharing edges. So, I have a tetrahedra. I have another tetrahedra. The corners are shared. The faces are never shared. The edges are shared, but not as often. Why? That's the question. Face sharing never occurs. Face sharing never occurs. No, no, you discuss with one another. You will have to tell me why. Uh, yes or no, uh, no longer is sufficient. You will have to tell me the reason. <coughs> So I have one silicate tetrahedra. So I have SI04 4 minus. And I have another SI04 4 minus. And I'm telling you that this tetrahedra has some faces. This tetrahedra also has some faces. But the two faces never sit on top of one another, never touch one another. Why? The corners can be shared, the edges can be shared, but faces will never be shared. Why? Faces are not sharing. Hmm? Face Faces are never shared. Corner and edges. Yes. Small one big cube if you split into the eight 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Like any cell structure. Okay. If you think one big, it is a your one unit cell. Okay. So now question will arise. If you divide it into into the eight cubes, small cube. Mm -hmm. This one in a eight. Okay. So if we each silicon have the tetrahedral structure itself alone, and if you think here, silicon and opposite corner one one sitting. And this structure is repeating one by one, one by one from up, down. So, there will be... Can you draw it and show? Because I'm not able to visualize what you're saying. Can you take a look at what he's uh, drawing and tell me whether it's reasonable? Tetrahedral structure is like that. If corner will share, then face won't share. No? It's not cubic, okay, face will share, hmm. it's structure is like, ah. but that structure is like that, no, uh, suppose ah. it is atom is here. Like that, if you go, if it is a so silicon, here, 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 subsequently, it, a silicon type with a so so corner will share, then face won't share. share. So, so these are corners, yeah. hmm. so if, if, if it is, face. if it is sharing all four corners, yeah. then it is the shear face that is sharing, right, yeah. so you can have a tetrahedra like this sitting on top of another tetrahedra. Yes. But this doesn't happen in silicates, that's what I'm saying. You understand? Yeah, very good. You are thinking right, yes. So where is silicon? Can you uh, label the silicon atom? Okay, and oxygen is where? Uh, silicon in the middle. Ah. And so, what is the charge associated with silicon? Plus. A charge associated with oxygen? Negative. Hmm. Now, if you now let us think about various ways in which the silicon can sit with respect to the other silicon atom. If I have phase sharing, if I have phase sharing. Silicon silicon distance versus when I have just that corner sharing, silicon silicon distance, which one would have lesser energy? See, lesser energy means there will be lesser repulsion between the two silicon atoms. Yes, so clearly the two silicon atoms will try to increase the distance between the two, right? So, exactly. So, between two tetrahedra, you would expect a lot of distance. Uh, sorry, between the two tetrahedra, the silicon occupying the two tetrahedra, you expect a lot of distance. That means to say phase sharing is not an option, right? It's not an option. So, wonderful. How would you explain this using something called VSEAPR theory that you would have studied in your chemistry? Yeah. Correct? It makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Correct? It makes sense, right? And why is this silicate tetrahedral? Because, can uh, silica is the outer balance is so can you explain this to me using molecular orbital theory? So write down the electronic configuration of silicon and explain to me why silicate would be tetrahedral. It is just like methane, right? It's just like methane. Yeah. So what is the hybridization of, let us say, carbon in methane? What is the hybridization of silicon in this? So write down the electronic configuration. You can use your data, get the atomic number of silicon, write down the electronic configuration of silicon, the electronic configuration of oxygen and explain to me. Yes, so what is the electronic configuration of oxygen? 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that's correct. Electronic configuration of silicon? 3s2, 3p2. 3s2, 3p2. Yes, very good. So, those are th that is the outermost configuration that you have written. So, please tell me what the hybridization will be. Remember, hybridization will happen between energy levels that are similar, comparable. Yeah. So, clearly between 3s2 and 3p2, there could be hybridization. Similarly, as far as oxygen is concerned, between uh, uh, S and P, you can have hybridization, isn't it? Very good. So, why don't you tell me the hybridization? Hmm? And uh, also do the electron filling, please. Please, this is 
this is uh, something you have studied in high school chemistry, isn't it? So. Because here oxygen 2, oxygen is there, for 1 oxygen, 2 pH 2, 2 pH 2, 2 pH 2, 2 pH 1, Z 1. Okay. 2 pH 2, 2 half pH 2 is there, and here 4 half pH. Okay. So silicon is bonded to 4 oxygen. So how many lone pairs should be there? 2 lone pairs. No, this, this one will go here. And okay. Like that. Mm -hmm. Then here oxygen should also so if one. this goes from here to here, how many lone pairs are there? Four lone pairs. Ah, so and what is the kind of hybridization? That's correct. So it's SP3 hybridization, there are four lone pairs. So very good. So you could now use your molecular orbital theory to understand why number one, silicate is a tetrahedra in the first place. Because, right, number one. Number two, because silicon is positively charged and because it is tetrahedral, you know why silicates are, are such that their faces will never uh, be on top of one another. Their faces will not be shared between two silicates, correct? So clearly in the nature of bonding influences structure. So structure is not independent of bonding. Bonding and structure are correlated. That is another, earlier I told you structure is of course defined, uh, has some geometrical rules about it. But it is not that structure is independent of bonding, structure does depend upon bonding. Then this was a good example of that, right? Very good. So we started with electrons in atoms. For example, you wrote down the electronic configuration of silicon and from that you were able to tell the kind of hybridization that, will, that is likely to occur in silicates and hence you were able to talk about tetrahedra and the way in which these two tetrahedra would sit next to one another and hence you were able to establish the correlation between bonding and structure. And we were also able to perhaps as a consequence appreciate that once you know the electronic configuration in the constituent atoms, you will be able to describe to a first day order at least the bonding in the solids. Okay. So uh, to summarize, we started with lattices. We looked at the distinction between Bravais lattice and crystal system. We looked at the brick or tiling example and based on that we found that there are 7 crystal systems and 40-14 Bravais lattices and then the question was about uh, these lattices. Now remember if you have a perfectly single crystal system then it is a single lattice but if you have multiple grains sitting next to one another it is a polycrystalline system. Polycrystalline system in systems inevitably have multiple crystals. Now these crystals could be aligned with respect to one another such that you have either a high angle grain boundary or a low angle grain boundary. You could initiate grain growth and recrystallization, grain growth and recrystallization so that you have bigger and bigger crystals. All of those the possibilities exist. And then the question was, okay, let us take a, a certain crystal, let us say silicates. In the case of silicates, we made an observation, a geometrical observation. The silica, silicate tetrahedra do not share, have any phase sharing and the question was why? You were able to use electrostatic interactions to explain that and furthermore uh, you were able to explain why it is tetrahedral in the first place by using bonding and you were also able to explain why it should be SiO44- based on bonding. So bonding and structure are deeply correlated, are deeply connected to one another and that is really the take home as it stands today. So the learning objectives of this uh, session was to be able to appreciate lattices and crystal systems and the distinction between them. So I want you to be able to explain, to define what lattices are, crystal systems are. So you should be able to define it, okay. And then subsequently you should be able to write down electronic configuration of constituent atoms and from that be able to rationalize bonding in solids and perhaps also ra rationalize the structure that these solids exhibit, okay. As far as pedagogy is concerned, uh, the outcomes of uh, today's discussion had to do with um, the importance of mind maps or uh, concept maps and uh, also the brief dis discussion on Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, we looked at what ontologies are. Uh, we examined the possibility of using mind maps, concept maps as a project ideation tool for MS PhD students and uh, we also looked at uh, free online tools that might be 
useful in a classroom setting also for collaborative mind maps, concept maps and things of that sort. Uh, and then we started out by discussing uh, something called instructional scaffolding. So that is really what we covered today. So uh, l let me s close this. Uh, let me close this with uh, the following. I will uh, ask you to make a mind map of lessons that you have learned today. As far as the content is concerned, not the pedagogy part, but as far as content is concerned, put the list of co things that you have learned. You can discuss together. First of all, discuss the keywords. If the keyword is very important, underline it. If it is very, very important, underline it twice or something like that. You understand? And then between them, start drawing connectivities and show it to me. So that will be the exercise that you will do over the next two to three minutes. You understand? So a mind map or a concept map for whatever you have learned in this session. So only it is based on content? On this content, yeah. So what are some keywords as you understand? Let's start with solid. Solids, okay. Then Very good. Okay, solid is a keyword as far as you are concerned. Very good. Then crystalline. Crystalline, yes, okay. Polycrystalline or multicrystalline, single crystalline. Crystalline one and they are amorphous. Very good. Very good, yes. And then you can also put grain boundary somewhere. So between single crystal and polycrystal, you can actually put grain boundary. If I introduce grain boundaries, I basically go from single crystal to polycrystal. Very good. Poly, yeah. yeah, you can put poly or multi crystal mm -hmm. and then you have single crystal. Grain what boundary. the difference is grain boundary. So, so you, you have a connector there. Here yeah. you can write grain boundary. Very nice. No, and this you can miss. Oh wow, okay. Right here, uh, oh. No, you can put then single, single crystal. Right. Yes. Poly crystal. Then we can convert. conversion. Ah, so interconversion, yes, yes, beautiful. So recrystallization is possible. Very good. Recrystallization, crystal growth, grain growth, right? And here also you can have order you can put in between. Ah, yes, from amorphous, you take amorphous, order it, you basically get into the crystalline regime. Now that crystal could be either polycrystal or single crystal. Grain boundaries connect them. You can go from poly to single by using grain growth recrystallization. Wonderful. And, uh, crystal system. Crystalline, uh, again one more we can put it in crystal system and previous lattice. Mm. So crystalline objects, so you have lattices uh, first and crystal systems. So seven crystal systems, 14 lattices. Seven, right? Mm. Very good. Excellent. Okay. And yes. Then, uh, bonding. Bonding. You have to introduce bonding somewhere in this knowledge tree. Where will you introduce that? Now, also, I had asked you a question on short range order, long range order. That we can so, we have to introduce here. Ha, so, this would have both short and long range. Mm -hmm. This would have only long range. Mm -hmm. So, you can. No, no, there, there is, uh, amorphous would have short range no, order. Only short range. Only short range order. Mm -hmm. And remember, even liquids can have short range yeah. order, yes. And uh, crystalline objects can have long range order. Very good. Huh. Now, why do you have short range order? The answer to that is bonding. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now there is a bonding connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, does the bonding depend on atomic electron, uh, the electronic configuration of atoms, constituent atoms? Yes. So, you have bonding in solids, right? Uh, constituent, uh, uh, electronic configuration of constituent atoms, right? Uh, atoms bracket electronic configuration you can put. Now, to explain bonding, uh, what was the theory that we used here? Yes. in this? Yes. VSCPR and molecular orbital theory. Very good. 
another party yeah. to issue yeah. MOT VSCPR and MOT fantastic now now silicate structure. so silicates now silicate is it an ionically bonded system or a covalently bonded system covalent. obviously ionic I because that is why i said sio4 4 minus it always will have some covalency yeah. but when i write sio4 4 minus it means it is clearly very prominently ionic there will always be a mix of covalency and ionicity there is nothing that is perfectly ionic but the way it has been written okay and the explanation based on vscapr etc was enabled primarily because of ionicity yeah. right so in this particular ca yeah. case yeah fine so but anyhow the bottom line here is uh, in order to in order to uh, explain the structure in the system in order to explain even the nature of bonding in the system what did you assume about silicate for example you said si what will be the charge associated with it it's positive so you are actually invoke you are using the ionicity of silicates in order to explain the structure of silicates here correct or your electronic interaction ah electronic interaction yes so why don't you write that down so so bonding can be either covalent ionic metallic even van der waals right yes, yeah. so bonding can be covalent ionic Weeks. metallic van der waals so those are possibilities and you have examples for each of these uh, van der waals so the bonding determines structure it's a very important thing right so structure is not independent of bonding structure of atoms the way atoms are organized around one another has to do with bonding it is very clear right so wonderful so that is the concept map so i shall i show this here so this is uh, the concept map that students came up with themselves by themselves for the lesson so uh, maps like this can be very helpful to the students because uh, they can see what they have learned and there's a visual representation of what they have learned so uh, concept maps mind maps can be very helpful to students and uh, there is also a lot of literature showing that student learning outcomes uh, are enhanced when visual representations are used okay with that we come to the end of this session of uh, this swayam course thank you